Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TF, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. As of tonight, the United States has suffered 84,506 reported deaths from coronavirus. And now Donald Trump wants to deny that number. The modeling that has so far proved relatively accurate on the coronavirus spread in the United States says that on August 27th, the day Donald Trump is scheduled to be officially renominated as the Republican Party's candidate for president, the United States of America will have double, double the number of deaths from coronavirus that it has tonight. On Donald Trump's renomination day, the model now projects that we will have about 160,000 confirmed deaths from coronavirus and we can be guaranteed that in Donald Trump's nomination acceptance speech that night that that number will be ignored or lied about. Donald Trump has lied about deaths before. The most loathsome lie Donald Trump told as a presidential candidate was that he lost hundreds of friends on 9-11. How did he Dr. keep us Trump. safe when the World Trade Center came down? The world is... I lost hundreds of friends. When Donald Trump said that in the South Carolina debate, I immediately tweeted that he was lying. The next day, Donald Trump changed the hundreds of friends to many, many friends. He said that he lost many friends on 9-11, and I immediately tweeted that that was also a lie. The truth is that Donald Trump lost zero friends on 9-11, zero. He did not attend a single 9-11 funeral, not one. And what he was trying to do for his political gain was to steal the grief of thousands of people who lost family members and loved ones and friends on 9-11. Donald Trump was trying to steal their grief and make it his own and turn it into political currency. And that same Donald Trump is now trying to steal the grief of the thousands of American families who have lost a loved one to coronavirus, the thousands upon thousands of Americans who have lost a friend to coronavirus. Donald Trump wants to steal their grief and make it disappear. Just throw it away. Just pretend that that grief and those deaths do not exist. It is impossible for Donald Trump to dishonor the American dead in this pandemic more than denying the truth of their deaths. deaths. To pretend their deaths did not happen is to pretend their lives did not happen. It is to pretend that their lives did not end in a previously inconceivable way. In a hospital bed, alone in a room, no family allowed, no hand holding at the bedside on that final day, in that final moment. And then no funeral, no memorial service of any kind where the grieving could gather, where they could wrap their arms around each other to try to contain that grief. Donald Trump is going to dishonor all of that. Moral cartographers have in the past believed that they have mapped the extent 
of the depravity of Donald Trump. But there's always more. Always. Now that Donald Trump's re-election plan is to lie about the number of deaths from coronavirus, Donald Trump knows that he is going to have to publicly disagree with the government's leading expert on the coronavirus, Dr. Anthony Fauci. And so today, Donald Trump decided to do that more forcefully than he has in the past. Donald Trump, using absolutely zero scientific authority or intelligence, today tried to contradict this statement that Dr. Fauci made yesterday in his Senate testimony about reopening schools. The idea of having treatments available or of that re-entry of students into the fall term would be something that would be a bit of a bridge too far. Even at the top speed we're going, we don't see a vaccine playing in the ability of individuals to get back to school this term. What they really want is to know if they are safe. And that's the question that I have to be due with what we discussed earlier about testing. And today, here's what Donald Trump had to say about that. I was surprised by his answer, actually, uh, because, uh, you know, uh, it's just to me, it's not an acceptable answer, especially when it comes to schools. The only thing that would be acceptable, as I said, is professors, teachers, etc., over a certain age. I think they ought to take it easy for another few weeks, five weeks, four weeks, who knows, whatever it may be. Not an acceptable answer. That's from the person who said this country was going to go from 15 cases of coronavirus straight down to zero in response to a reporter's question. Not an acceptable answer. That's from the person who America and the world and history must never forget said this. And then I see the disinfectant where it knocks it out in a minute, one minute. And is there a way we can do something like that uh, by injection inside or or almost a cleaning because you see it gets on the lungs and it does a tremendous number of the lungs so it'd be interesting to check that so that you're gonna have to use medical doctors with but it sounds it sounds interesting to me it is thursday the 14th of may of 2020 and you are in west coast cookbook and speakeasy i am your chef de cuisine justice putnam and our daily special is Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays, a little bit of jambalaya, a little bit of spice in your life. Speaking of spice, wow, the maggot troll bots just, I don't know what activated them, but they were out in force last night, almost as if something really bad's going to come down the pike that will probably make Trump look bad as if he doesn't look bad already. (laughs) I mean, come on. I guess they think we're just piling on now. Uh Uh-huh. And uh, their algorithms are really bad. (laughs) They really are. (laughs) I responded to uh, that Sean Spicer parody account. And for some reason, I I got trolled. I got botted. (laughs) Like, oh, you fell for a parody account. I did. I fell. Oh, my gosh. Well, anyway, uh, something bad's going to be ca- happening uh, for Trump. And probably uh, that's one of the reasons why he's lying about COVID deaths. Now, they've been lying all along, okay? I mean, they've been undercounting COVID deaths from really the beginning on purpose. And uh, apparently even that's too high now. So uh, if you don't test, you know, I mean, Trump's already come out and said every time they test, the numbers are really bad. It's almost like the he thinks the tests are causing the virus. Well, that's what we got in the Oval Office. And he's pretty much uh, a leader among mice. (laughs) Experimental mice, maybe. Uh, He's a brainy guy compared to the people who vote for him. My God. And the ones who are considerably smarter are craven, soulless ghouls uh, looking for any opportunity, even, hey, 
If there's a buck to be made just before the asteroid hits, these people are going to be trying to make it. All right. They're not going to be hugging each other and and extolling their love to their loved ones. They're going to figure a way of trying to part people with their money as if that's going to matter after the asteroid hits. Forty years ago today, Mount St. Helens blew up. And in the weeks before that, and I brought this up here in southern Oregon, and uh, people were rather uh, upset with me. <laughs> because apparently, according to them, to die free while breathing in 5,000 degree lava is our God-given right, and we are not sheep. You know, it's easy for them to say that. Because the people who actually did not get off that mountain when scientists said get off that mountain, and they had like the mayor from Jaws, I guess he relocated into Washington State and said, oh, the tourist season is going to be really bad if we close the mountain. Come on. Scientists said, hey, these rumblings are temblers, not tremblers, by the way. They are temblers. And they're very strong. We think that magma is coming up that tube and is going to blow. There was one guy up there who said, you're not going to get me off this mountain. I've been on this mountain. No jackboot cops taking me off this mountain. So no jackboot cop or any kind of cop took him off that mountain. And he had a lot of supporters and other people who just said, oh, you know, the weather's nice. I don't want to be cooped up. Let's go to Mount St. Helens, have a picnic, maybe a barbecue. We'll make schmores. And then when that mountain was starting to blow and they started hightailing it out there, that guy, that, that little crusty guy at the top of the mountain, well, he was vaporized. And the people who were hightailing it out there and got about 15 to 20 miles away, well, they were, they, they just breathed in 5,000 degree hot gases and suffocated on that. I think maybe you're not really suffocating, but 5,000 degree hot gases, pyroclastic flow, 20 miles away in seconds. One guy gets vaporized, the others just, you know, died a very horrible, painful death. And I don't know, the fraction of a second or two, that's a long time when you're choking on 5,000 degree hot gases. But it's easy for people 40 years later to say, oh, well, at least they weren't sheep. Uh, nothing says more being a sheep than going to a volcano when it's trembling. And denying that 5,000 degree hot lava has a debilitating effect on your life. It's fake news. Egghead scientists. They're always overreacting until everything they said that would happen happened. And then everybody goes back to the scientists and said, You know, why didn't you convince me better? That's exactly what bullies say every time. We get bullied into allowing this death and destruction because all we can do is throw up our hands and say, what a bunch of idiots. Freedom. Freedom is not being stupid. All right. Yeah, I guess you have the uh, constitutional right to be stupid. But I'll tell you, actuaries don't like stupid. They'll charge for it. And if they can't get it from you, they charge over the cross-broad spectrum, just like a socialist would. And I don't want my insurance rates going up because of stupidity of others. That's why we have seatbelts. Oh, yeah, we had to argue about the constitutional jackboot intrusion on our freedoms because people have to wear seatbelts. People were arguing about that. So, yeah, all you're left to do is throw up your hands and say... As long as it doesn't cause my insurance rates to go up. And if it does, then, you know, we have this constabulary that will enforce the seatbelt law. But apparently, old keeper sheriffs might just say, we're not going to enforce seatbelt laws. The reason they actually enforce the seatbelt laws is because it gives them another excuse to pull somebody over and find something. Because they're bored. There's only so many donuts in Medford, Oregon. Am I in a peak? Yes, I am. 
two weeks ago when Orange County uh, beaches were flooded by a lot of people, not just from Orange County, but all over the Southland. We all said, in two weeks, let's watch the spike. Well, in two weeks, there is a massive spike of COVID in, in, <laughs> infestations, of COVID infections, and COVID deaths. Granted, you know, these numbers may not all be tied to the opening or opening of the uh, the taking of the Orange County beaches in spite of uh, restrictions because of the pandemic. We've already seen spikes in infections and deaths in states that said, oh, no, you can't have a mail in ballot, you Democrat snowflake. If you think voting is important to you, you go risk your life. And people did. And now people are dying. Wisconsin Supreme Court said, we don't care what this Democrat governor says. We just nullified him and we're opening up the state. Well, they've already had instances from two weeks ago and their numbers are going up. And the governor is left with hopefully there's enough you know, right-minded people who will just, you know, keep doing what we're supposed to be doing. Yesterday when I went out to do errands and pick up some supplies, very few people were wearing masks. It's easy to be cavalier if you don't know somebody working in an ICU who's a friend or family member. It's easy to be cavalier when you don't have a loved one, family member, or a friend. That could be a loved one, too. Suffering from the effects of the disease, and we don't know if they're going to live or not. It's easy to be cavalier if that's not happened to you. Are we Americans? I thought... We rallied together in a time of crisis that we didn't have a faction of people who hate anything that might be helping another person. I, I, did we really think they would have that much power? They've grabbed it. Are we just left to throw up our hands and say, as long as it doesn't raise my insurance rates? What's on the rest of the menu here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? Well, of course, at the top, the reason Trump claimed that Dr. Fauci's warning on reopening schools too soon is not acceptable is because his reelection strategy is to lie about COVID deaths. Yes, their undercount is still too high, making the orange god seem more moral than he's... Uh, really uh, should be viewed upon by mere mortals. On the rest of the menu, a New York GOP congressional candidate wants kids back in school just like in the pre-vaccine era because apparently she has some deep investments in iron lungs. I would think. A GOP senator says he smells the stench of politics in states trying to stay safe. Politics. <laughs> that's what they call caring about others and caring about their people it's all just politics and emails reveal Trump's nominee to be the nation's top consumer safety watchdog was involved in sidelining the detailed CDC reopening guidelines well fancy that after the break, we move to the chef's table, where New Zealand plans to spend vast amounts of money to counter virus job losses. Wow. They're actually going to try to pay for something? Wow. New Zealand. And authorities work to evacuate tens of thousands of people as a strong typhoon roars toward the pandemic-hit Philippines. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit.
of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. To the right of the page is our chat room link, monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. To the leftish of our chat room link there at the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com is the link to our Patreon page. And do please become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio. If you could afford the cost of an espresso-type coffee drink, remember those? <laughs> if you could afford that, even in this time of peril, it really does help us, all kidding aside, it really does help us pay our bills. And uh, we still need to get some software and machinery updated here. Because we've been running for nine years, going on ten and we had to replace all the machinery in the midst of all that. And it looks like we're cycling it in again. So we've gotten some parts and we still need software and more parts. So thank you to those of you who have been so generous over all this time. And to those of you who are new and could afford it, um, it, it, it might make your soul feel better or more uh, correctly. It really does help us, and we would thank you as we thank those who have helped so generously all this time. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that, and we thank Tom for doing that. And he and Kelly do so much more than just monitor and take care of a uh, social media site, okay? Just so you know. I, of course, take care of at Justice Putnam on Twitter, and you might as well follow me there. I also post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime and get that linked up on social media because I heard that's what you do. Follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, and wherever podcasts can be found. All right. We better get into this first offering here in the curated part of the show. Boy, these rants, especially when I'm at a peak, peak, they kind of go on. But, hey, we're a salon, as I've mentioned before. Dan Desai Martin of the American Independent brings us this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A Republican congressional candidate has suggested that children go back to school during the coronavirus pandemic based on the fact that children attended school before vaccines were invented. Well, you know, as far as I can tell, kids were going to school before the wheel was invented. Children have a greater ability to develop immunities to this virus based on the evidence we have so far. Well, that tells you everything you need to know about Claudia Tenney a former member of Congress who was running for the seat she held in New York's 22nd Congressional District. A cautious approach to returning to school is essential. Children attended school in the pre-vaccine era for over a century. And you know what else, lady? They, a lot of them had to live in iron lungs. I, are you old enough to remember iron lungs? I do. And the only way we got a lot of people... Out of those iron lungs? Yeah, contact tracing. Making sure that if somebody contracted the polio virus, that all their friends and family were checked out, and all the people that knew their friends and family that had contacted them were checked out. And on and on and on. Tenney's suggestion ignores data on mortality rates prior to the invention of vaccines and on the eff effectiveness of vaccines, as well as warnings from the nation's top infectious disease expert. Wow, you know, people were dying of tetanus lockjaw. Kids went to school. You know, you know lockjaw never stopped kids from going to school, except when they're dead. And also, we have this weird uh, disease that is connected to COVID-19 that is particular to kids, a hardening of the blood vessels and the uh, uh, arteries in the heart, arterial arteries, what I'm trying to say, arterial arteries. That's I'm sorry. That's redundant, but a hardening of the arteries in the heart. Some of these kids just go through it. Others die. So, yeah, kids went to school during the pre-vaccine era. And many of them died 
even when they were confined to an iron lung. Great Oliver Willis at the American Independent brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Senator Tim Scott, a repug of South Carolina, told Fox News that he smells the stench of politics in the decision making of Democratic governors who have resisted reopening their states before coronavirus guidelines say it is safe to do so. Echoing other repugs who have advanced the baseless conspiracy theory, Scott said the governors were acting in order to influence election results and not out of concern for public health and safety. You know, they always project, they always co-opt, and they always lie and then accuse us of being the liars. Okay, let's go on. Scott also argued that the public should look at the pandemic, which last night had killed over 82,300 Americans, but this morning it's now blasted past 84,000. Scott says that we should look at all that through the prism of optimism. Yeah, at least those people died for freedom, did they? Experts have repeatedly warned about reopening states before the data shows conditions are safe enough, but hey, just like those stupid scientists on Mount St. Helens, they just overreact. I mean, we have an economy to keep going here. I, you know... They keep telling us before that volcano would blow, and it never did. <laughs> Actually, no one ever said that Mount St. Helens was going to blow, because until it did, everybody thought all the volcanoes along the uh, Pacific Rim here in Oregon and Washington were dormant. And Mount St. Helens put the lie to that. A dormant volcano became alive? How does that happen? Well, I guess if you're tied up to the magma... You're colluding with magma. You might come back. Aaron and Michael Biesecker of the Associated Press bring us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grist Thursdays. A former chemical industry executive nominated to be the nation's top consumer safety watchdog was involved in sidelining detailed guidelines to help communities reopen during the coronavirus pandemic. Internal government email show. Oh, my. But her emails. Now, the ranking Democrat on the Senate Commerce, Science and Transportation Transportation Committee is questioning the role played by nominee Nancy Beck in the decision to shelve the guidelines. Beck is not a medical doctor and has no background in virology. Trump has nominated Beck to be the chairwoman and commissioner of the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission, a position that requires Senate confirmation 
and she is scheduled to appear before the Senate committee later this month. Now, emails obtained by the AP show that Beck was the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's main point of contact in the White House about the proposed recommendations. At issue was a 63-page guide created by the CDC that would give community leaders step-by-step instructions for reopening schools, daycare centers, restaurants, and other facilities. Oh, so she's the government authority who said on deep background, this report will never see the light of day. It must have been her. Maybe she shouldn't be the head of this watchdog committee for consumer safety if this is the way she protects consumers. Do you think? All right, let's get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. This is Take-Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. This week, Bomb. News and talk show producers all have lists of folks they can call for a reliable point of view. Michael Moore, who's the executive producer of the controversial new movie Planet of the Humans, may well have gotten himself removed from those lists with his new film, in which he dares posit that green energy isn't as green as you think, and further, that the current iteration of global capitalism, now all in on green energy, isn't going to save us. Director Jeff Gibbs and his GoPro record the diesel generators powering green events on cloudy days and acres of abandoned solar and other alternative energy equipment. And some of environmentalism's biggest stars, Al Gore and Bill McKibben, to name a couple, are cast as having been co-opted. How Moore and Gibbs feel about this is obvious. Why they feel that way, though, maybe not so much. If the existing capitalist order is permanent and unassailable, is it not in environmentalist interest to have the capitalists on board? Maybe so, but in the view presented here, the combination of environmental impacts of corporate green energy writ large, the middle-class aspirations of billions, let alone those unborn, don't provide for a sustainable future. In Trump land, Moore stood before a red state crowd with a chalkboard and showed how tax increases to pay for single-payer health care would actually save people money. Planet of the Humans could have benefited from this technique. Crunching the numbers would have shown the comparative benefits of green energy, which gets short shrift here, but more importantly, perhaps, illustrated the point that without changes far more radical than using solar panels, humankind is, well, like the title suggests. So goodbye, Michael Moore, reliable progressive, hello, or maybe it's welcome back, Michael Moore, bomb thrower. This has been Take-Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. Catch up with us at Take-TwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Jason Goldman. When preparing for a date, a human might use a small spritz of cologne or perfume. And male ring-tailed lemurs also splash on some cologne to impress the females. The only difference is they secrete their own scents from glands near their wrists. And during the breeding season, the males rub the secretions from their wrists onto their tails and then wave the tails near females. Researchers actually call this behavior stink flirting. Biologists already knew that lemurs have scent glands and that they use them to communicate their social rank or to identify their territories. Scientists also knew that sometimes males use their scent glands as part of a dominance display against potential rivals. But nobody had really looked to see whether the females were relying on the male scents as part of their mate selection process. Nobody until Kazushige Tohara, a biological chemist at the University of Tokyo. Working at a wildlife laboratory, he and his team collected the secretions from male ringtailed lemurs' wrist glands twice a month for several years. In an email, he described the male scent as fruity and floral. 
the researchers identified three chemical compounds in the secretions that were in higher concentrations during the breeding season, which suggested that these chemicals, all of which are long-chain fatty aldehydes, might be involved in mating and reproductive behaviors. After identifying the three compounds, the researchers soaked cotton balls in a variety of smelly substances, then offered them to female ringtails. And the lady lemurs spent more time sniffing cotton balls that were infused with the three aldehydes, especially during the breeding season. More research is necessary to be sure, but Tohara says this is the first time a sex pheromone has potentially been identified in a primate. The findings are in the journal Current Biology. While none of these three compounds have yet been identified in the secretions of any other primate, they have been found in lamb wool. Their presence implies that these substances might help newborn sheep recognize their mothers. And one of the chemicals also acts as a sex pheromone in two different types of insects. Which means that these kinds of long-chain fatty aldehydes are likely used widely throughout the animal kingdom for social communication. No wonder they're often used in the colognes and perfumes we humans pay through the nose for. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Jason Goldman. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to NetrootsRadio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. It doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com page and hit our Secure Donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution, and you'll get a wondiferous pair of Netroots Radio stickers for application to your backpack, your bumper sticker, or your banjo. Well, it's up to you which backpack you want to put it on. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetRootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. There's a general sentiment today that multimillionaire corporate chieftains are pigs. But I think that's unfair to pigs. Those oinkers are remarkably intelligent animals with a sense of social responsibility to the common good of the group. Compare that ethic to the ethic of self-entitlement expressed by pompous and petulant corporate executives like hotel magnate Monty Bennett, who recently grabbed millions of dollars in economic relief meant for small businesses. It was so stinky that even the thievish Trumpistas made him return the money. Yet, a shameless Bennett continues to insist that he deserves a government bailout. What are all those taxes we paid supposed to provide us with, anyway, he whined. Well, Monty, maybe with a literate workforce, clean water, paved streets, fire and police protection, and other public basics that subsidize your business. But our taxes aren't meant to guarantee your profit. Yet, Bennett flaunts his cluelessness. I won't apologize for being a capitalist in America, exclaimed this socialist capitalist in March as he was grabbing taxpayer handouts. Indeed, he's apparently a very poor capitalist. Last year, before the coronavirus catastrophe struck, the Ashcroft Trust that he heads had a $113 million loss and saw its stock value nosedive by 80%. Yet, he took special care of himself, pocketing $5.7 million in personal pay. This is Jim Hightower saying, meanwhile, Monty is in line for more government money from Trump and company's new $500 billion pot of cash exclusively reserved as emergency aid for giant corporations. Moreover, Bennett and his ilk can take this bailout with no requirement to use any of it to protect the paychecks or save the jobs of employees. They can even use our money to raise their own pay. What do the corporate powers from Wall Street to Walmart have in common? They hate the Hightower Lowdown. You can see why at www.hightowerlowdown.org. To His Excellency the Governor from the ACLU, Ray, the 2020 elections and the coronavirus pandemic. I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. 
The April 22nd letter to Massachusetts Governor Charlie Baker and other high state officials begins with two undeniable propositions, that voting is a fundamental right and that the coronavirus pandemic should not be allowed to compromise that right. The letter commends the Secretary of the Commonwealth, who oversees elections, for having concluded that a voter qualifies for an absentee ballot if the voter is ill or quarantined or staying at home or avoiding a polling place as a precautionary measure, and then highlights other necessary steps, including robust education and funding to ensure that widespread voting by mail takes place, which will require, among other things, the printing and distribution with postage prepaid return envelopes of absentee and early voting ballots in a number of languages. The state should also expand early voting from the present 11 days before an election to 20 or 30. For those who will need to vote at polls on Election Day, a sufficient number of polling places is vital because enough polling places in appropriate locations, along with mail-in and early and absentee voting, will shorten lines, allow greater physical distancing, and help protect poll workers and voters alike, all of which is critical at this time to the preservation of democracy. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. Do you ever enjoy a cold beer after a long day's work? Well, if you were a worker in the United States from 1920 to 1933, you would have to break the law to down a brew. And on this day in labor history, the year was 1932. That was the day that massive demonstrations for the re-legalization of beer were held in New York City and Detroit. Prohibition had lasted for more than a decade. The outcry for the repeal of the alcohol ban was growing. Mayor Jimmy Walker of New York City decided to hold a parade to support what he called beer for taxation. Mayor Walker argued that allowing the sale of beer would provide more taxes for the federal coffers. Getting beer brewing up and running again would also help cut unemployment, a serious issue in the midst of the Great Depression. 100,000 people answered the mayor's call and marched in the streets for beer. That same day in Detroit, 40,000 marched for beer. Many in the crowd were from the city's working class. One float in the Detroit parade bore a sign that read, Beer, in giant letters. Around the one-word demand was printed the words farmers, masons, coopers, tinsmiths, carpenters, brewers, and porters. Workers of all types wanted their beer back. Participants in the parade chanted, Who wants beer? We do! A little less than a year later, the government answered their call and ended prohibition. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com, like us on Facebook, and follow us on the Twitters at Labor History in Two. It's time for Nicole Sandler's What's News from NicoleSandler.com and the Progressive Voices Network. The Labor Department reports new job numbers every Thursday morning. This time, we learned that workers filed 3 million new unemployment claims last week, bringing the eight-week total of coronavirus-induced layoffs to 36.5 million. On Thursday, we'll hear from Dr. Rick Bright. He's the man who was ousted recently from a job overseeing federal coronavirus vaccine development. He'll testify to the House Committee on Energy and Commerce's Health Subcommittee that the Trump administration was unprepared for the crisis, and he'll warn that the nation could face a surge in infections and deaths without enhanced preparations for further outbreaks. In prepared testimony obtained by CNN, Bright says, quote, Our window of opportunity is closing. If we fail to develop a national coordinated response based in science, I fear the pandemic will get far worse and be prolonged, causing unprecedented illness and fatalities. Without clear planning and implementation of the steps that I and other experts have outlined, 2020 will be the darkest winter in modern history. Judge Emmett Sullivan is the judge overseeing Michael Flynn's case. He put a hold on the DOJ's attempt to drop the case against the former National Security Advisor. On Wednesday, Judge Sullivan appointed a retired judge 
John Gleason to argue against the Department of Justice's case to dismiss the case and to decide whether Flynn should face perjury or contempt charges over his efforts to abandon his guilty plea to a charge of lying to the FBI. Earlier this week, a group of former Watergate prosecutors filed a letter asking Sullivan not to dismiss the case, and nearly 2,000 former Justice Department employees also signed an open letter asking that the case not be dismissed and criticizing Attorney General William Barr for putting the possible dismissal into motion. Breaking news Thursday morning, as a lawsuit accusing Donald Trump of violating the Constitution's Emoluments Clause by accepting foreign government money through his D.C. hotel, can proceed to fact-gathering about Trump's profits. The Richmond-based Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled Thursday morning in a 9-6 to vote to reject Trump's bid to shut down the lawsuit the governments of Maryland and D.C. brought alleging violations of the emoluments clauses. Trump, who's vigorously fought a series of similar lawsuits for years, now can only turn to the Supreme Court for relief. So this happened. Federal agents on Wednesday seized a cell phone belonging to Senator Richard Burr as part of the DOJ's probe into stock trades Burr made in the early days of the coronavirus pandemic. The agents served a search warrant on Burr at his home in the D.C. area. Burr is chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, and on February 13th, when he was receiving daily briefings from health officials on the virus outbreak, sold a hefty percentage of his stock portfolio in 33 separate transactions. Just one week later, the stock market took a dive. Members of Congress are prohibited from trading on insider information they receive as part of their work. The Internet was a buzz Wednesday night, pointing out that such a warrant being served on a sitting U.S. senator would require approval from the highest ranks of the DOJ and shouldn't be taken lightly. And the fact that no such warrants were executed on Senator Kelly Loeffler, who is similarly accused of insider trading, but she's been a faithful Trump foot soldier. While Burr's Intelligence Committee issued a report saying that Russia did interfere in the 2016 election to help Trump, stay tuned. Jay Powell, chair of the Federal Reserve, said Wednesday that, quote, the reversal of economic fortune brought on by the coronavirus pandemic over the last two months in the U.S. has caused a level of pain that is hard to capture in words. Powell also said that the Fed is releasing a survey Thursday concluding that among people who are working in February, nearly 40 percent of those in households making less than $40,000 per year lost a job in March. Quote, the scope and speed of this downturn are without modern precedent, significantly worse than any recession since World War II. Powell also warned that the pandemic would result in an extended period of weak growth that could leave lasting economic damage. The market fell 500 points Wednesday on Powell's comments. What happened to Wisconsin? On Wednesday, Wisconsin State Supreme Court struck down Governor Tony Evers' extension of his stay-at-home order issued to fight the virus. The 4-3 decision, written by the court's conservative majority, said a governor does not have the authority to extend such an order without input from lawmakers. The majority wrote that it was not questioning Evers' power to set statewide standards during an emergency, but that in an ongoing crisis such as a pandemic, he has to work with the state's legislature on long-term policies. Evers issued a stay-at-home order in March and extended it shortly before it was due to expire on April 24th, leaving it in place until May 26th. Republican state lawmakers challenged him, saying he needed their input on any long-term rules. Favoritism much? Paul Manafort, Trump's former campaign chairman, has been released from prison due to the risk of coronavirus infection and will reportedly serve the rest of his seven-year term under home confinement. This according to one of his lawyers. Manafort was indicted by then-special counsel Robert Mueller and convicted in 2018 on a witness tampering charge. He later pleaded guilty to charges of conspiracy to defraud the United States and obstruction of justice in a case linked to his lobbying for pro-Russia politicians in Ukraine. His lawyers in April argued that he should be released due to the pandemic, writing, quote, Mr. Manafort is 71 years old and suffers from several pre-existing health conditions. 
It should be noted that there has not been one reported COVID-19 case in the prison where Manafort had been held, and none of the other prisoners were released from that facility. Hmm. Supreme Court justices continued their third and final day of unprecedented oral arguments by telephone on Wednesday, grilling lawyers about whether states can replace electors planning to vote for a presidential candidate who didn't win the popular vote in their state. The court is hearing two cases involving the Electoral College, one from Colorado and the other from Washington state. Justice Samuel Alito said if electors were given total freedom about how to vote, quote, it would lead to chaos where the popular vote is close and changing just a few votes would alter the outcome. Justice Clarence Thomas suggested that tying states' hands could open the door to fraud. Quote, can a state remove someone, for example, who openly solicits payments for his or her vote? I got to do. And that's just a bit of what's news for now. I'm Nicole Sandler. If you appreciate these reports and the Nicole Sandler Show, I hope you'll consider making a contribution. My work is 100% listener supported, and I can't do it without your help. Find out more at NicoleSandler.com. Please click on that donate button. Thank you for accompanying us here to the Chef's Table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 58 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting a high of maybe in the mid-60s. Also, we are expecting, oh, just a little over a third of an inch of rain today with a little bit of clearing tonight. Well, today we're going to be rain early, which is happening right now, then remaining cloudy with showers in the afternoon. Winds out of the southwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Cloudy skies early tonight, then partly cloudy after midnight. And then tomorrow, intervals of clouds and sunshine. High near 75, winds light and variable, and then some more rain, about a half an inch on Saturday, another half an inch or or a little less on Sunday, and Monday and Tuesday looks like quite a bit of rain as well. Coronavirus confirmed cases in Jackson County of Southern Oregon is at 50, and apparently people aren't getting well. And uh, fortunately, none have deceased that we know of because, you know, no one tests. We don't have the test to be able to test right here at the mothership locally. And you can't get much more local than the mothership. Grass pollen is rated as very high. The region air quality index is in the good range at 26 parts per million. And the daytime UV index is very high at eight. Barometric pressure is falling at 30.02 inches. Visibility is down to three miles and relative humidity is at 98%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. London is 56 and fair with a lot of coronavirus still. Paris is 59 and sunny with a spike in coronavirus. Rome is 83 and sunny, and they have a uh, advisory that the infrastructure may be conked out because of a heat advisory. And also, the coronavirus is not being knocked out because of the heat. Too bad. Kiev is 51 with a light rain shower and lots of coronavirus. Kabul is 61 and partly cloudy with coronavirus. Hong Kong is 77 and partly cloudy, and they just don't care about social distancing. Because apparently they don't care about coronavirus. Tokyo is 56 and partly cloudy and they'd like to open their economy, but they still have coronavirus. 
Sydney, Australia is 56 and mostly cloudy and mostly the area is not affected by coronavirus or being opened up, but they may get coronavirus still. San Francisco, California is 56 and mostly cloudy with coronavirus and New York, New York is 64 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny with coronavirus. And that is weather from around the world brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. Nick Perry at the Associated Press brings us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. New Zealand's government plans to borrow and spend vast amounts of money as it tries to keep unemployment below 10% in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic. Finance Minister Grant Robertson unveiled a budget unlike any in the nation's history. Debt would shoot up from just over 20% of GDP to 54% by 2023, with thousands of jobs created by putting people to work, building homes, and improving the environment. Still, the increased spending will not be enough to offset the economic devastation caused by the pandemic. Unemployment is expected to rise from just over 4% to nearly 10% by June, and Robertson acknowledged that tourism, which at had accounted for about 10% of the economy, was not going to be the same for many years to come. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle, c'est tout, c'est tout. Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer, mes automnes quand les feuilles tombent partout. Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne. Jim Gomez of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grist Thursdays. A strong typhoon slammed into the eastern Philippines today after authorities evacuated tens of thousands of people while trying to avoid the virus risks of overcrowding emergency shelters. The first typhoon to hit the country this year rapidly gained force as it blew from the Pacific, then barged ashore in San Policarpio, town in eastern Samar province, around noon local time. Weather Agency Administrator Vincente Milano said the typhoon came as the Philippines is trying to fight COVID-19 outbreaks, largely by locking Filipinos in their homes and prohibiting gatherings that can set off infections. More than 11,600 infections, including 772 deaths, have been reported in the country in the last few months. Typhoon Vong Bong, which was packing max, maximum winds of 93 miles per hour and gusts of 115, was forecast to blow northward and barrel across densely populated eastern provinces and cities before exiting the north on Sunday. Well, bunker down, hunker down, wash your hands if you can, wear a mask. Stay alive. Beat the typhoon. Beat the virus. Okay. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio will broadcast on and we'll meet up tomorrow for Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. 
and we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TR, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coer Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver